Now, the narrative around AI is slowly shifting from being a risk to the labor market. This as its power and benefits become more and more apparent. Just how effective can AI be in addressing Africa's socioeconomic challenges? Johan Stein, who is an AI and automation thought leader, joins us for a closer look at unlocking the continent's AI potential. Thank you so much for your time, Johan. Now, what is the weighting of Africa's AI capability? Currently, most of AI's capabilities are in the so-called global north, mm -hmm. in the US, in the, in, in the EU, definitely in China, potentially in Russia. There are some countries here in Africa that's doing a lot. Sadly, South Africa is exceptionally far behind, but there's a lot of potential to get onto the bandwagon and to start doing real good with it. Yeah, I think thank you for that intro because I must ask you from where I, I sit today, it does look like uh, Africa's participation is from an import and a consumption uh, a basis. How do we even begin to get involved, uh, you know, in a more meaningful way? Yeah, look, I'm a big proponent of saying that we need AI solutions for Africa by Africans. Now, most of the platforms that we consume are from European or, or US or, or Chinese companies, and, and some of them have great benefit. But we need to create our own platforms, especially if you think of our own languages, about 3,000 different languages and dialects on our continent. We've got our own socioeconomic challenges. We have a lot of biases in these data sets regarding gender and especially ethnicity. And luckily, there are a number of really fascinating initiatives already. But it's not scaling. I don't think it always has the government support that it needs. We cannot be left behind as a continent. I mean, as you know, it's the fastest growing continent in the world, the youngest demography, most likely the only unsaturated economically um, busy continent in the world. But we cannot rely on foreign powers anymore. We have to do it ourselves. And we have enough talent and enough businesses and enough finance. I just don't think we have enough government support across the continent and definitely not in our country, sadly. Mm. Um, does that mean because then there is no government support that maybe the environment is not fertile enough to attract uh, meaningful and significant investment, particularly into research of AI? Yeah, look, there's a lot happening in some of our top universities. Uh, uh, some of our institutions like the CSIR are doing really amazing work. I mean, I think especially Toronto University of Technology seems to really be doing incredible work. Look, we are trying to keep the lights on, which is a mm. second industrial revolution problem. <laughs> I don't know if our government can even start thinking about 4IR in practical terms, mm -hmm. given what they're dealing with at the moment. Again, the talent is there. The businesses, local businesses are there, especially startups, some amazing AI startups in our country. But in order to scale it and in order to really make a societal impact, it has to be national and it has to be understood by and supported by our government. I mean, Johan, let's talk about uh, the private sector here and the role that the private sector can uh, play uh, in terms of uh, making sure that we do get moving uh, in that direction. As you say, we've got a second industrial revolution problems that the government is deeply uh, consumed with. Uh, but could the private sector get ahead of us here, uh, bringing investment along, uh, but also ensuring that we do remain competitive here? Look at our banking and financial services sector, and our telco and insurance sector, a lot of amazing progress on AI technology and initiatives. I think a lot of them that I deal with are good citizens. They want to contribute. What I often hear from them, and I've experienced this myself, I will reach out to government, whether it's local or national, um, just never hear back from them. It's almost like they don't understand what this technology is and how it can help us. And not that it means those people are stupid. I mean, AI is largely misunderstood across the world in all uh, sectors. But I do think if we can get some of our private institutions, our banks in particular, together, again, there are initiatives, but these are like drops in an ocean. We need some sort of an ecosystem. I mean, more than a year ago, we heard about the launch of the AI Institute. I haven't heard anything about it yet. It does seem like the CSIR and others are busy doing more. We do have the talent. I think we do have the willpower for government to include all of us who work in this field to really help them and to really help our citizenry. But it seems that the avenue to get to them, to listen to us, doesn't exist, in my experience at least. Are there behavioral uh, bottlenecks currently in the way of AI's progress? 
Look, I, I think, if I understand your question correctly, the fact mm. that people misunderstand it oh, yeah. means that they fear it. Mm. We naturally fear what we don't understand. When we think about AI, a lot of it is formed by Hollywood movies, by the popular press. We think about killer robots, killer weapons. We think about job losses, which is a big challenge in this uh, field. It doesn't have to be. But it's almost like, and this is what I feel with a lot of the business leaders I deal with, it's almost, let's just think about it later. Let's put our heads in the sand like the ostrich. We deal with some other challenges at the moment. But I think on a societal leadership level point of view, there is a lot of mistrust because there's a lack of understanding. I must ask you, uh, Johan, about even the work that could be done, though, to ensure that, uh, you know, Africa is at least at, has a seat at the table in terms of the ethical considerations around AI. Uh, because, of course, there is uh, something uh, to be said there about uh, the bad players in any new development with any new technology. They are indeed a sinister and a bad players. Uh, so I'm keen just to get your thoughts on that issue, uh, you know, how we can ensure that where there are conversations around uh, global standards and ethics, we're at least uh, sitting there. Yeah. Look, again, ethics, you've just mentioned it, incredibly important. Just from a, a regulatory, regulatory point of view, I mean, we've got the EU AI Act that's making a lot of progress. It will most likely be signed into law in the next year or two. Some progress in the US, we've got nothing. I mean, we've got Popia, which is somewhat sufficient, although I've not seen the trans unions and the trans nets of the world being prosecuted yet for data breaches over the last two or three years. We need an, a regulatory environment, and not just in South Africa. I think from an African Union point of view, we need a lot more work to be done. It's a regulatory framework that should be suitable for Africans specifically. And then, of course, all of this hinges on talent. You know, I think what happened after working from home and COVID, we in this country in particular, we've had a massive brain drain. Now it's so much easier to work for foreign companies. You don't have to relocate your family. You, you don't have to worry about visas. You just work maybe in a weird time zone on the, the kind of west coast of the U.S. in dollars. Are we doing enough from a private sector and a government point of view to really initiate at scale the right kind of skills we need for African solutions for Africans in the AI space? All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your insights there on the opportunities that AI uh, presents for Africa and what we need to be doing to unlock its potential. Uh, that was AI and automation thought leader Johann Stein.